Hey everyone, welcome back for video number two in our brand new functional breathing mini course. If you missed video number one, you can find the link for it in the video description. I've also included the link for the playlist for the entire mini course there as well. Last week we spoke about the biochemical dimension of breathing, and this week I want to start talking about the biomechanical dimension of breathing, which I'm actually going to break out into three separate videos. Part one this week will discuss some general breathing mechanics, and I'll also share with you some examples from my own life of how this plays out in the human body. Part two will be next week where my incredible colleague Verity will be joining us to walk us through a full postural and gait analysis, again using my body as the model, in order to demonstrate how our breathing pattern and the position of our rib cage really has this big impact on our pelvic position, on the arches of our feet, on how we stand on the ground, and how we move through space. You're not going to want to miss next week's video. And then I'll release part three two weeks from now, where I'll share with you a special myofascial stretch specifically for your diaphragm so that you have a tool to begin addressing some of these biomechanical factors on your own. If you're new to the channel, my name is Tara Bianca and I am a long-time holistic health practitioner and functional breathing coach. What are we talking about when we talk about the biomechanics of breathing? We're talking about how you are actually getting air into and out of your body. So most people just associate their nose with breathing, but they take for granted what actually has to happen for you to be able to inhale and exhale air. So underneath the tip of the iceberg, which is your nose, there is a massive subsurface mountain, which is representative of the elaborate coordination of your entire musculoskeletal system and your nervous system, which have to operate properly for optimal respiration. What are some of those main structures involved with this process of breathing? Of course, your respiratory diaphragm. Your respiratory diaphragm is your primary muscle of respiration. So this idea of diaphragmatic breathing is a bit of a misnomer. You're always breathing with your diaphragm. You have to breathe with your diaphragm. But some of us have gotten ourselves into certain postures where maybe the diaphragm is not able to get enough leverage to really move through its full range of motion, which then deprives us of the most complete and efficient breath possible. Along with your diaphragm, you have your external intercostals, which help to elevate the ribs in order to make more space to allow air to come into the body. And then during quiet, relaxed breathing, your exhale should happen passively via elastic recoil of the tissues without any muscular activation. In fact, one of the classifications of a dysfunctional breathing pattern is something known as forced abdominal expiration, which is defined as inappropriate and excessive abdominal muscle contraction in order to aid expiration. Of course, when we start to increase our work intensity and engage in more active breathing, we have a number of accessory muscles which start to join the party. During your inhale, that's mostly going to include muscles of your neck, your throat, your chest, and your upper back. So anything that's really going to lift the ribs. Examples being your SEM, your scalenes, your subclavius, your trapezius, pec major and pec minor, your lats, serratus anterior, and serratus posterior posterior superior. And then during your active exhale, that's going to include muscles of the abdominal wall, the lower back, and the lower rib cage. So anything that really pulls the ribs back down. Examples of this are going to be rectus abdominis, so your six-pack muscle, your external and internal obliques, um, your transversus abdominis, which is sort of like the, the corset muscle, um, serratus posterior inferior, your quadratus lumborum, and of course your internal intercostals. Technically, any muscle that makes contact with your rib cage can impact and be impacted by your breathing. And also anything that has fascial connections to your diaphragm can impact and be impacted by your breathing. And these fascial connections make up almost everything. Those connections make up the entirety of the contents of your torso, so including your internal organs, all your major blood vessels, your major, major lymphatic vessels, tons of nerve tissues, including everyone's favorite, the vagus nerve, and so much more. And those connections also extend up into the throat, into the mouth, into the tongue. They extend up into the nose and the nasal cavity. They extend up to the base of the skull. And from there, 
they even indirectly connect to your dura mater and the meningeal layers of your entire central nervous system. And then these connections also connect downward. So think about going into the pelvic bowl and the pelvis itself, down into the adductors, and all the way down to the base of your feet. Your diaphragm is really a central component that is connecting everything in your body. It's also worth noting the origin of your phrenic nerve, which is at the level of C3, C4, C5 in your cervical spine. This is the only nerve providing motor function to your diaphragm, so it's pretty important. Where can this all go wrong? Because anything that connects to your ribs or your diaphragm can impact and be impacted by your breathing, again this week we have this bi-directional relationship between a muscular imbalance and or a poor breathing pattern and all these other things I'm about to mention. Your posture, your spinal alignment, which then impacts all of your spinal nerves, your gait, your ability to coordinate movement, your balance, your ability to feel safe in your body, your ability to generate power, your ability to generate strength, your ability to circulate blood effectively or lymphatic fluids effectively, your ability to um, have good movement of your cerebrospinal fluid, your integrity of your airways. These things can also impact your entire autonomic nervous system, which then goes on to determine your respiratory rate, your heart rate, your blood pressure, your digestion, your perception of stress, your perception of pain. Uh, it could affect your sexual health, your reproductive health, and the quality of your sleep. So those are all examples of areas where you can really start to develop symptoms if something is dysfunctional. But that list is more so representative of the effect, which means we still have to determine what is the cause. There are five established dysfunctional breathing patterns, also known as chronic maladaptive breathing patterns. So right there in the title, we're already back to this chicken or the egg scenario, because when you usually hear the word maladaptive, it implies that this is a response to something that already happened. So the question becomes, is the dysfunctional breathing pattern causing all of these symptoms, like some of the ones I just went through? Or was there some type of assault on, say, the nervous system, for example, some type of trauma which triggered the dysfunctional breathing pattern in the first place? So from my point of view, both are possible because of the bi-directional nature of the system. So what are the five dysfunctional breathing patterns? Number one, hyperventilation. Last week we spoke about respiratory alkalosis and hypocapnia, to little CO2, which is the result of long-term hyperventilation. So this breathing pattern disorder is more biochemical in its origins. Number two, periodic deep sighing characterized by frequent sighing and irregular breathing patterns. So we've talked about sighing in other videos. This dysfunctional breathing pattern would also be considered more biochemical in origin. Number three, thoracic dominant breathing. So this is upper chest breathing with little lateral expansion of the rib cage and a high reliance on all those accessory muscles that we mentioned earlier, but happening even at rest, not just during active breathing. This is normally accompanied by a feeling of breathlessness. And this pattern is more biomechanical in nature. Number four, forced abdominal expiration. I also mentioned this one earlier. This is again an excessive use of the abdominal musculature in order to complete your exhalation. And again, this is happening even at rest, not just during active breathing where you might expect it. This is also biomechanical in nature. And lastly, number five, thoracoabdominal asynchrony, where the rib cage and the abdomen are just not working in coordination. This one is also biomechanical in nature. So we have these five common dysfunctional breathing patterns, and they can certainly be the cause of many of those symptoms that we mentioned earlier, but they can also be an effect of something else going on in the body. So now what about a muscular imbalance or a postural distortion? Can that be the cause of all those symptoms that we spoke about earlier and maybe even the original trigger for a dysfunctional breathing pattern? Well, if you ask anyone with an osteopathic or manual therapy background, they will answer with a resounding yes. 
I happen to fall into that category. So here we go. Let's take a look at some examples. I think one very obvious example and, and sort of an extreme example, but I think it's one that most of us will be familiar with is scoliosis. So if you have true scoliosis or you know someone with scoliosis, you know that it can be an incredibly debilitating and exhausting way to live. So with scoliosis, we have this obvious structural imbalance, right? We have these abnormal spinal curves and then we build up the musculature around that dysfunctional spine and what happens is we sort of cement in the dysfunction. So let's just take a look at a couple images and use our instincts here. Do you think a person is going to be able to take a truly deep breath when their spine looks like this? Do you think they're going to be able to get full and even expansion of their ribs on both sides, that nice lateral expansion? There's no way. And on top of the muscular imbalances, they might be experiencing nerve compression, disc compression, a constant feeling of stress because this person does not feel safe in their own body. They normally experience more pain than the average person. They can have a lot of digestive issues. They could maybe have some kind of reproductive or sexual issues going on. A spine like this is a very heavy load to bear and it's a perfect example of how posture and muscular imbalance can create a dysfunctional breathing pattern as well as a number of other symptoms. Another great example that I see a lot with my students and my clients and even with my mom actually is whiplash injuries. So this can absolutely wreak havoc on the body, especially if it's not treated early on. So with whiplash, we have this actual physical trauma, which can go on to create all kinds of issues, including ligament laxity through the cervical spine. It can create cervical disc compression. It can be the genesis of nerve compression through the neck. And this is really pertinent to our breathing patterns because remember that the phrenic nerve, which activates your diaphragm, originates in your cervical spine, C3 through C5. This person is going to be bracing a lot. They're gonna be afraid to move their head and their neck because they feel unstable and they're in a lot of pain. They may be afraid to move their eyes because where your eyes go, your neck follows. And now because of this direct impact on the phrenic nerve itself, in addition to all these other structural issues, it is quite common for someone with a whiplash injury to start to develop a dysfunctional breathing pattern. Often this person is going to start to breathe more shallowly they default to upper chest breathing. They may be using their accessory muscles a lot in an attempt to sort of stabilize their neck and feel a little bit more safe. They often go into a slight forward head posture. Uh, this can sometimes lead to some chronic mouth breathing just because of the nature of the position. Their resting respiratory rate gets faster and they often wind up in chronic hyperventilation. Long term, this can lead to those symptoms of chronic anxiety, really poor sleep quality, fatigue, lack of energy, a very low pain threshold and chronic pain, lack of resilience, poor digestion, and I often see this accompanied with a weak immune system. This person gets sick again and again. So how do you get this person back to baseline? There's really two roads back in. Number one, you have to address their dysfunctional breathing pattern and get their breathing more functional. And two, you have to treat and address those originally damaged structures that set off this cascade of events and horrible symptoms in the first place. And if you don't choose one of those two roads, you're simply going to be chasing symptoms forever. Scoliosis and whiplash are two pretty extreme examples, but I wanted to impress upon you how one dysfunction can lead to another, and then another, and then another. And I want you to realize that even more mild versions of a muscular imbalance or postural distortion can still um, cause you to experience some amount of symptoms. That means that any amount of imbalance or rotation or asymmetry through the rib cage or the torso or the pelvis can have an impact. And what's interesting is that humans are not designed to be symmetrical, right? Our organ system is structured in such a way that it ensures that we are not symmetrical. And so what you find for a lot of people then is that this organ asymmetry sort of allows the right side of the rib cage to kind of sit in a natural resting position. But what you'll find for many of us is that the left side of the rib cage is outflared or externally rotated. And now the part you've all been waiting for, I am going to show you exactly how this plays out in my own body because I am the perfect example of this pattern. 
Okay, so here we are. I'm sort of sucking my belly in a little so that you can more clearly see the outline of my rib cage. One image is with my arms down and the other is with my arms up. And so now notice that the right side looks like a normal rib cage. It's folded over nicely, sort of protecting the liver. And then look at the left side. Look at how pointed up and out those ribs are. The two sides are completely different. Notice that there's a more defined waist crease on the left side and that the right side waist looks a little shortened. And notice that the curve of the waist on the left side is repeated at the border of rectus abdominis on that left side. Okay, now let's look at this from the back, which I think makes the asymmetry and the imbalances even more clear. So here you can really see there's almost a V-shaped indentation defining that left waist crease, whereas the right side is almost a straight line. It looks like there might be a little bit of a hip hike on the left side, which makes sense for my history. Notice how the torso is rotating toward the right, a bit side bent to the left. And then look at the compensation through that left shoulder blade. Yikes, <laughs> look at the difference in the two scapulae. So that right scap looks like it's lying pretty flat on the thoracic cage, but then that left scap is really winging away from the rib cage. That does not look cute at all. I definitely have to work on that. That's as far as I'm going to go today because Verity is going to be joining us next week to do a real deep dive into analyzing my posture and my gait. And we'll talk more deeply then about my health history and the path of my symptomology through time and how what you're seeing on the screen, these little muscular imbalances and postural distortions really match up with what I am experiencing in terms of symptoms in my own body and how it is impacting my breathing. Verity is an absolute expert at this. She does this all day, every day with her clients. She's so insightful. And I know that next week's video will be really impactful for you in terms of of helping you to understand better what's going on in your own body as well. And if you're really interested in understanding these connections better, Verity has offered to do a very special live 90 minute workshop in my private Be Light community, which I will be hosting on January 21st. I hope you'll come check it out. I'm leaving the link for that in the video description as well. The takeaway for today is that sometimes small imbalances can manifest as big symptoms. And also sometimes you can look like a bit of a mess on camera and not really be experiencing many symptoms at all. For me personally, I haven't really been working on actively correcting anything these days because I'm just not super symptomatic at the moment. And just like you guys, I get a little complacent when I don't have an active reason to be working on something. Uh, but there have been very long stints in my life where I was experiencing a ton of pain and I was really symptomatic for extended periods of time. And and when I was in pain like that, a lot of the work that I did was around breathing re-education and really using my breath to create more postural awareness and postural balance and also to regulate my nervous system. You know, this breathing thing looks so simple, and it is but it's also so powerful and so effective. So if you are someone who is very symptomatic right now and anything I said today kind of resonated with you, make sure you come back next week and the week after where we'll continue this conversation around breathing biomechanics. Thank you so much for joining me today. Please like and subscribe. Please share it with your friends. Please leave me some comments and I will see you next week.